12.15. Okay. All right. We're excited to uh, introduce this next panel to you around enabling salespeople. So I think kind of like the panels that you heard this morning, uh, this group has some fantastic experience around some of the things that they've done with enabling their sales team. And so Lena, who's one of our uh, uh, leaders at AgVen, leads our partnership management team, who a lot of you are working with in the onboarding, is going to uh, lead us through this session. Thanks, Tracy, and good morning, everyone. Um, like Tracy said, I'm Lena Head. I am the Director of Partnership Management here at Agvin, where I have the honor of working with and leading our team of partnership managers, who most of you in this room know well as your partners in your digital adoption journey. Um, outside of that, I'm also a grower myself, a part of a mid-sized grain and livestock operation in central Illinois. So talking about um, how our retail partners market and engage with their customer base is, is something I enjoy from both sides of that coin. Um, I'm your moderator for today's panel on enabling sales, uh, sales teams and creating opportunities. We're going to dig into some cross-selling, marketing, segmentation, and kind of overall sales team management. We have a great diverse group of retail partners sitting up here today. Um, there's no one-size-fits-all approach to the ag industry, and our panelists really um, give us a good diverse perspective of how they market to their customer bases. So without further ado, Craig, I'll uh, start with you. If you could kick us off by telling us a little about yourself, your organization, and maybe your guys' approach to marketing. Sure. Uh, Craig Patty, Vice President of Sales and Marketing with River Valley. Been with River Valley about five and a half years. I've been in this role for four and a half. Uh, I have a group of eight people that we lead and, and, and support our sales team of about 50 employees. And that's grain, agronomy, energy, and feed as well. So we're a full service co-op. 30 locations, Iowa, Illinois. Uh, the river divides us. Sometimes it feels like an ocean, especially when we're working with manufacturers. But uh, it's, it's a bit of a challenge there. But uh, our marketing team consists of two people. And I really think that's where AgVen really helps us drive some of our initiatives and be very efficient. Um, so we have one person that's just customer, excuse me, internal customer facing, so employee facing, and then our community relations. And then we have one individual that's dedicated to our, our, our customers facing information. And then a big part of that is portal uh, with our campaigns and such that we run through our, our portal as well. So um, yeah, I think that's about it. So yeah, I'm just a little disappointed about the yard games. I was looking forward to jarts tonight, but uh, <laughs> Pass along. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Cassandra Morari. I am from Saskatchewan, Canada. So I think there's a few of us in the room actually this year. Uh, I am the COO for a company called The Rack, uh, based out of West Central Saskatchewan. It is my family's uh, independently owned business. So my parents started it almost 40 years ago. And I am now second gen uh, in transition, we'll say in succession, the long term succession plan. That's a whole other conversation we could have another day. Um, so I work closely with our leadership team. Uh, we have about 11 locations across that area, and um, we are in crop inputs, uh, which I think you guys call, everyone says agronomy, but so crop inputs, fuel, fertilizer, fuel, uh, agronomic services, and custom application. Um, and our marketing approach is, uh, so I, I kind of also wear a hat of the marketer person right now. We are transitioning that role. I also wanted to dig in and sort of re- reimagine, I guess, how we're targeting marketing or how we're managing that within our company. So AgVent has been a huge part of that. Um, a few other people in our team that we work with that help with those initiatives, but we're sort of, I would say, getting our feet wet now using the app to, uh, to change the way we're marketing. And um, yeah, that's, that's me. Well, my name is Greg Culp. I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing at Mercer Landmark. We are a cooperative in Northwest Ohio. Um, we're around 750 million in, in sales, and that would be everything from agronomy, grain, feed, and fuels and lubricants. And so um, the agronomy team, uh, there's about 15 on the, the what we call crop production advisors that, that are on our team. Um, and then we have a seed lead and a conservation agronomist that are all part of that as well. And so one of the things that we do because of our size, we don't have an entire marketing department. I mean, I'm, I'm part of that. Um, our seed lead's part of that. Our grain team is part of that. And then we, 
we partner with a company called Brandit, uh, who is a local marketing agency who helps us with. Um, we might come up with the idea, and they do a great job of making it look nice. Um, and then, so I will also compliment Bailey and the Agven team. They do this, they do the same thing. They we come up with an idea, and she does a great job of making it look good. Um, maybe cleans it up. Says great idea, but uh, let's scratch that. Let's let's do this. So we appreciate that. Awesome. Well, thank you guys all for being here. Uh, I want to jump right in and kind of just address sometimes what is an elephant in the room. Marketing can get a bad rap sometimes. And I'm sure we've all been on the receiving end of companies that aren't doing it right. And it, it can be irritating. But honestly, when it's done correctly, we've actually found across our partner network that growers who engage with marketing are actually 114% uh, do 114% more business with their retailer than those that don't. So how do you incorporate digital marketing into your overall marketing efforts to support your sales teams? Okay, everyone's looking this way, so I guess I'll go first. Um, digital marketing is really important. I mean, if you, especially if you think about the, the next generation of growers. Um, they're spending a lot of times on their, on their phone or their iPad. Um, and so we want to make sure that it's complementary to what our what our sales team's doing, what we're doing in person. It's still a relationship business, but it's kind of that push-pull strategy. I mean, at, at one point, the salesmen or salespeople are, are quote-unquote pushing the products, but what, what we want to do from a marketing standpoint is help pull that demand. And so we use all the social media, um, and then also we take advantage of email marketing, customer segmentation to make sure we're driving the right message to the right grower because you don't want to send a wheat message to a grower who doesn't raise wheat. So we're making sure that the messaging matches the customer. Um, I'll, am I on? I'll jump in. So um, we went live last December and uh, our, the history of the company really is that we temp notoriously put the cart before the horse. So we went live in December. We barely knew how to use it. And then we launched a customer uh, marketing kind of a sales program, I guess, that goes on a trip next next February to Tampa, um, which is really a big deal when you're from the cold part of the country. So that's really exciting for all of them. So we're taking a couple, 200 growers to Tampa. So we launched this trip, and then we went to our suppliers, and we were like, do you want to be a part of this trip? And we offered them kind of a two-year marketing package, and we had just gone live, so we're like, we can offer you this new way where we can you know, segment customers we can you can tell us how many products based on what their partnership level was uh, we'll deliver email app notification text whatever format you think is best or we'll pick for you and we'll do that uh, you know and here's what we'll charge you to be a part of that kind of to see like will it work and like meanwhile we didn't even know how to log in and use the marketing thing like I remember getting on a call I think with Horacio and one of the marketing gals and being like hey so we did this but like we don't know how to do it. Can we do it? <laughs> like yes, you can. We're like okay. We thought somebody told us that when we signed up. But anyways, so flash forward a year later, um, it was very successful. And you know, interestingly, and I, I don't know, I don't think it's that different here. But our suppliers didn't have that pulse check before on um, you know if we sent if we sent an email before, which is really difficult to do. Uh, very painful to try and send an email. We didn't know how many people read it. We didn't know what the messaging, you know, should be. It wasn't always about their product. It was usually about our stuff. So this was the first time we ever sort of did an initiative around their products. They got to pick them. And we segmented, but they worked with us on that. Uh, and and in some case, and we saw, you know, a significant level of um, revenue, but also their sales increase, and we can show them that. Most of them have said to us, we don't even really care that we saw your sales revenue this year or the results. We have a base mark now. We have a baseline now to work off of with you. And they're like, well, when this trip is done, how do we keep this going? How do we partner and continue doing that? So that was new for us, and I think it was sort of the, like, jump and you'll grow wings philosophy where we just picked something and thought, we'll run with it. Um, and that's, that's been pretty successful to integrate digital into our, into our world. Craig, River Valley has also had some experience working with manufacturers on marketing campaigns. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I felt pretty good about that until I seen Cassandra's numbers last night. So, like, whoa. Healthy competition. So, anyhow, yeah, we've had, we've had some success with some of our key partners. Uh, them investing instead of putting dollars towards a magazine or, or something they can't track, they can track that through the portal, right? So they can make that investment with us instead of putting it somewhere where they don't know if they're getting a payback. So we've had a lot of success with that. I think 
the foundation of that is that we deliver, all, you know, and I think we have a good relationship initially with those manufacturers. They know that we'll, we'll if we're committed to selling, we'll make the sales. And so they'll put those dollars towards us. So we've had a couple, two or three different campaigns this last year. It's been a nice little reve revenue stream for us. And it's also, you know, it brought our relationship with that manufacturer closer. It's like you said, it's a different approach than just simply serving ads on, on agronomy or ag websites. They are trying to run their messages through the trusted advisors, the, the people that actually have the grower's ear and are respected for giving them advice, which I think is a really smart move on their part. I, oh, can I add one thing? I think one piece I would add to that that's um, really, I think, has been a learning point for us is that when you do it that way, and I think it's the same approach you took. Um, for companies who don't have large marketing teams, which it sounds like most of us are in that boat, it forced us to create a calendar or a plan to follow because we had to deliver something. Like, as soon as they gave us money, which it doesn't always have to be tied that way, but as soon as they were like, okay, thanks, we expect something out of this, we had to get our ducks in a row real quick, and we actually followed a plan more than we've ever followed a marketing plan because we sit and have a meeting and like we're gonna do this strategy or use social media for this that, and then you know two or three ads happen or posts, and you kind of it kind of falls off sometimes because no one's really holding you know talk about accountability, no one's really holding you accountable, and it it forced us to create that, which I didn't really you know we didn't foresee that at the start, and now the way we plan marketing, I think even for our internal stuff has changed, uh, like we're more organized with it, so. Yeah, I would say, too, I, that's one thing that stood out to me. It really brought our marketing calendar to life. You know, it just really put, put it to work for us, and it, held, and it holds us accountable for falling through. But I do think that gets the manufacturer support, too, because they see what we're doing. We show them what we're doing with the companies, and, and we want them to be involved. How do you feel like your, your guys' marketing approach has been received by your customers? Have you, have you seen the impact uh, sales-wise, or have you heard feedback from your customer base? Um, I would say overall very positively. It's kind of it's fun to, even just to see the the comments sometimes just on on social media. Um, but we've had one one example that I guess comes to mind where it actually it drove some sales. So we I mentioned wheat earlier. Um, that was one where we fo focused on some wheat products. There was another one uh, called Yield On, which I know a lot of you who are Winfield United uh, folks in the room and maybe promoted that biological or biostimulant. And so we targeted a group with that. It was just really, it was a, a basic one. It was just our top, our top customer group. Um, but we went from zero gallons last year to almost 10,000 acres of the product this year. Just Now, that was a complete marketing. It wasn't just because we sent an email, right? It was the, that whole push-pull strategy. We made sure our, our sales team was engaged um, and, and could speak intelligently about the benefits of the product relative to other biologicals, and then, and then you, you have the, the message come through on email and come through on social media, and before you know it, you're driving a conversation uh, that maybe sometimes you, the salesman might forget to bring it up, and it's kind of nice when the customer says, hey, I saw this, I read this, tell me more about it, and before you know it, you, you got a sale. And so I think uh, that's one thing we've done, and uh, another one that I, I wanted to mention earlier that I think has, has been valuable, and you mentioned the calendar, and... Uh, when we have a calendar, we do it. When we don't, it's not nearly as well. And we have a thing we call the Landmark Minute. And it's just a, we take one of our, our advisors and they, they speak on a specific topic. Um, and we try to make it a minute or less because we know the intention span of folks is not that great, right? So uh, get right to the point and then get the call to action. And it's, it's not like, you know, a wholesale pitch. It's just to drive interest. And so those are some things we've done that I think have been certainly beneficial. And, and I think... If you look at the amount of shares and, and, and uh, comments, the videos always win. They definitely drive a lot more uh, engagement. Yeah, I, I would echo the comments on um, fall, it being followed up by one of the salespeople. So that's pretty key in it. I would say our customers have received it quite well. We also had a thing where if they turned off the marketing notifications, it killed their points calculator. So. That helped, I think. But either way, they can they can not they can still not interact with it and turn it on and keep it on, and they are interacting with it. So, uh, I think the follow up piece, it being part of a larger initiative, is important. Uh, the first few, we kind of fell on our face a little bit because our staff would say like, you know, this thing came out and we didn't realize or we can't remember how many are out there right now, and then people are seeing it and they're asking us or we're not following up. So, 
again, forced us to kind of, you know, what pattern, you know, what path you take, make sure the team knows first and then roll it out however you're doing that. Um, but, but some of our customers, you know, they're getting more focused calls and discussions now with our sales team. Um, it gives our sales team something more to be uh, specific with instead of, you know, sometimes they, they want to make the call, but they maybe don't know what to talk about right now, especially the younger, more junior ones. So it gives them something to follow up on. Hey, did you see this? We're talking about this right now. And uh, so that's been quite beneficial. I think too, you know, we talk a lot about our, our sellers and what keeps them from selling more. And a lot of it's themselves. It's the assumptions they have that, they, that a customer doesn't want to use a specific product. And so that's where we can drive it. So we'll educate them to Greg's point. We'll educate them on the value of that product's got to yield first and foremost, got to be an ROI for the customer. But a lot of times it needs to be beneficial to River Valley too. So the, the salesperson might be making the assumption they won't do it. Oh yeah, they're going to do it. <laughs> and we're going to educate them on why they should do it. So that's where the portal really comes into play because it's not an either or, it's an and. And the fact of the matter is too, they're all very busy people, right? Our sellers are extremely busy. There is no downtime in this business anymore, period. We go from seed, fertilizer, prepay, into spring, fungicide, and here we go again, right? So helping them, supporting them, and, and being successful is really where the portals come into play. That's a, a great segue, Craig. What do you feel like is the, the biggest obstacle or blocker that prevents your sellers from selling more? I think it's those assumptions. I think it's just it's interesting to see just like when you put out a campaign and you have that open rate and you can track that and you can see who actually had interest in that product. And the seller could be telling you, he's never gonna do that. Yes, he is, <laughs> he's gonna do it. So being able to track that and measure that and show that value to our, or to our sellers has been huge. I would add to that segmentation. So the, exactly what you said, but also like we couldn't segment before. We could, but it was like a real painful process through Excel. And um, so now we can segment like real quick. The biggest kind of hurdle I would say we found for those who are either just going live or about to go live is that it's a change in their daily habits. So we, you know, they are not, they being our sales team, they're not used to using segmentation at all. And they're like, I call on my guys. I know who I call for seed sales. I'm like, but do you? Like, do you know that those are the right ones? So we've had those conversations, but they still weren't really using it. So this year we're in our budgeting planning cycle right now. So this year we gave them kind of a, uh, project, I guess, as part of their planning. And it, it, and I said to them, like, this is really just for you to go through. They have to go through and identify 20 customers and do a plan on those 20 of what they think they could find because they weren't using it. When we asked them to do it, like five locations messaged, not me because they didn't want me to know, but they messaged somebody else and were like, how do I log in to the portal? They hadn't logged in. So segmentation is absolutely critical. They are almost scared of it. It's like they didn't know how to use it before and they're like, but I... I, I'm knowledgeable, so how could this thing, you know, no more than me, or it's almost an intimidation thing. So we made it really comfortable. I found out that a lot of them didn't log in, and we're like, look, we don't care. It's fine. We're not sad. Just, like, tell us. Well, let's help you. Like, this, we're all learning together. So segmentation, but getting them to change their habits, because just telling them to do it, it, won't, it probably won't happen. People are, you know, ha creatures of habit, I think, so. And I would say this isn't maybe directly related to AgVen, but I think themselves is one of the biggest barriers and that and that could be and I reason why I say that kind of generally is because for every person it might be different right um, in some cases it's just simply forgetting to ask for the order in some cases uh, for some it's a newer person that maybe lacks confidence and that and that leads us to training and so one of the things that we've tried to implement and um, we're doing a fairly good job of and that's utilizing the notes feature um, in connect because it's kind of sales 101, but a pre-call plan, knowing what you're going to talk about when you get there, and then the post-call analysis or the after-action review, that's a great place to put, hey, here's what went well, here's what didn't. And if I'm doing that as a seller, it's back to if I have a plan, I'll implement it or I'll execute it, um, and that's that pre-call plan. So um, I think that, that's been helpful for us from a note standpoint. Also, it helps from an internal collaboration standpoint where um, the grain team knows what the agronomy team's doing and the energy team as well because we're all looking at the same notes and so um, notes has certainly helped a lot planning I guess would be the main thing uh, and that it helps me as well because if I know seller X needs just a little bit of coaching on some basics or understanding the product a little bit better because they lack confidence um, and then accountability one of the things we did on, on the notes things we shared hey here's who's here's who's putting notes and here's how many they've made and here's some highlights they, that we've read because it's one thing to write notes, it's another thing for them to know we're reading them. 
Uh, because if nobody's reading them, at some point they go, why am I doing this? And I guess, yes, management should be, but really our encouragement to the team is it's not for us to track you. It's a tool for you to get better at your job. It's a, it's a great place for you to set a reminder for yourself that I got to call them back next Friday. Or when you go in there to review before your next call, you go, oh, that's right. We talked about X, Y, Z at the last stop. I'll make sure I'm prepared for that on this call. Yeah, be careful what you measure, right? Because it'll improve. Right. I don't even think you guys need a moderator. You're, you're de taking the segues uh, away <laughs> for me, which is great. Um, you kind of alluded to it, um, Greg, that the cross-functional communication across teams. I know it's a big topic, especially in these multifaceted co-ops and retail organizations. So um, tell me a little bit about your cross-selling programs. I know they, they probably vary a lot in how long you've been doing them, how structured and mature they are, but give us, give us a peek at, to what that looks like. Sure, and we, so we started with the term cross-selling and then we thought about that for a minute. Uh, internally, that sounds good, but if you're a customer, does it feel? How do you feel to be cross-sold, right? It, I don't know that I. So we, uh, I don't know that it was our idea, but we call it. We're calling it unified customer approach. That's that's what we're calling it internally, um, because that's what we want to be. It's a unified front to the customer, and so uh, that's the terminology we're using. Um, Connect has helped us to to make sure we're sharing notes back and forth. But I think it's um, Connect is part of it, but. Actually, connecting is the other part of it, right? And so we do bi-monthly meetings. We call them our unified customer approach meetings. And traditionally, we would have the agronomy team doing one thing and the grain team doing another and the feed. And so now we're getting all those teams together in one room, sharing ideas, sharing notes about customers. Because if, you're, if your business is like ours, we have some that are really strong in agronomy and not in grain, or they're really strong in grain and not in agronomy, and we could do this back and forth, right? So it's an opportunity for our sales teams to go, well, I, I know this guy, why don't you come with me? And it's a, it's a chance to build a relationship with the grower together, utilizing the strengths of the different people on the sales team. And uh, I will add one more thing, you ask how we do it. So we, we offer um, additional benefits from a financing standpoint. So the more segments you do with us, the better your financing. Um, grain is a requirement for any financing with us because that's our collateral. Um, but we, we still are able to offer 0% in, in the times that we're in, just on the customers that are all in. If, if you can do every segment of business with us and all your grain, we're still willing to do that. And then the interest rates go up, you know, 3%, 4%, 6%, dip, depending upon the level of loyalty. Um, and then one thing we, we tried this year, because we looked at that and we said, well, that's nice for the guys who want to finance, but for the ones who want to pay, what's the reason? And so we came up with a loyalty rewards program for those who are four or five segments strong with us, then we offer them kind of like a Kohl's cash. It's a, a few dollars for every dollar they spend with us, then that, that accrues throughout the season, and then that'll be available for them to use for their, for their next year's crop inputs. No trip to Canada? Not a trip to Canada. <laughs> it's <a laughs> That's right. Great, it's a, some very beautiful destinations there. Um, I would, so I think, uh, I hear that, and I like. There's so many cool things in that. We're structured differently, so there's a lot where it's it's hard to relate totally. And um, so we're structured so like all of our sales people sell all of our products, maybe with the exception of fuel. Some people are more focused on fuel, or the agronomists are a little bit more focused on agronomy. But in general, someone at a location can sell you any of the things we sell. Um, so I think our approach has been more about figuring out which customers aren't we selling to. So who's buying chem and fertilizer but not fuel, or vice versa. The, this, the trip has, has part of the earning points is you have to buy from all the categories, so that's kind of the same thing, a rewards program. Um, I'll go back to segmentation with that because now we know who isn't buying from all of the categories, and uh, it has, you know, it gives us something, it gives the sales team something empowered to figure out who they should be calling on or what are the gaps in their business um, that they didn't know. So it's, I would say ours is we've taken uh, them knowing who to work with probably as, um, as that approach. Yeah, we talk about the whole acre a lot. And for us, I mean, it's just imperative that we win in that space because our biggest competitor is Nutrien. They're not going to talk about grain. Uh, Growmark doesn't tend to want to do it very well, uh, combining those two. So for us, that's our opportunity. And so we really focus in on that. And uh, just being able to talk about the paycheck. And so 
when you when somebody's making a fertilizer purchase or or a energy purchase, they should be making a grain sale to lock in a margin, right? We can put that together. So we spend a lot of time talking about that. We spend a lot of time cross-selling, um, working, collaborating as a group. We are all one team, grain originators, salespeople, and that's how we go to market. That's that's how we win. Um, not without its challenges, um, but uh, you got to continue to coach through it. But uh, the portal really helps us with that. Um, you know, I, I just think that it's just a huge opportunity for us to, to nail and, and get right for a full service cooperative in our space. That's a great point. You do have a differentiated value that you bring to the market and it, it really is up to you to make sure that, that you're showing up and taking advantage of that different factor you have. What about incentivizing your teams to participate in this? I mean, it's one thing to try and get your customers to purchase from more segments or more products, but do you provide your sales teams with incentives to actually drive that? If I'm a sales agronomist, why do I want to help the you know, energy person get, get a sale on their end? Yeah, I think we, we try to do some, you know, some contests and some things like that to, to, to build a collaboration, but I think really it's about coaching through that and just knowing how important that is and what a differentiator that really is for our business. And I think that, you know, your good people see it, um, they feel it. And so I think that's the biggest thing. Um, we do a few different things. Well, the one thing we do, did introduce the last couple of years, we broke out into regions. So operationally we work as regions across our company. So we broke out those regions from a sales perspective. So we've sat down and said, okay, let's not, let's, let's find those 10, 15 key customers for that region. And then we, we've tagged those in the portal. So we keep our notes tracked by when 2024. Um, and so we focus on that from, from, from winning with those customers in that perspective. And, and so it's a contest. So at the end of the year, we'll do like a regional wrap up and uh, the winning team gets to do something fun. So we have, uh, pr prior to having the portal, I guess we always had our KPIs tied. So the, the more product sales people, they have a hard, higher weighting on their KPIs for product, but they have a portion on agronomy sales and vice versa. I would say that, uh, and even to the point of the panel before, money drives some of that and having a KPI in line does help, but it wasn't overly successful and the two teams were operating quite separate. Um, we made some decisions in the last few months to change up some of the leadership structure of that, and that's helped. But we've taken, it's, one of you said something similar, but we've, we were calling it one team, one customer internally, where we're really working on them working together instead of seeing it as like, my job is to sell agronomy versus my job is to sell retail. And they're in the same office, but sometimes they're not always working well together. So um, I guess what I'm saying is that the KPI approach has helped, but having the financial benefit uh, doesn't like doesn't seem to be the major driver. It's them being engaged and wanting to work with each other. So, doing more teams together, cross training them. Um, they're working through this pre-budget sort of project right now together. So you know they're not doing that individually and some things like that just to get them you know working together. And then I and then the, the support from each other in in having that call or doing a call like maybe you know you have a more junior agronomist and they do the sales call with the more senior retail manager and they learn from each other, and so there's, there's some benefit there um, that's helped. But so I like the contest idea, that might be fun. And I'll just add, I guess I'm not gonna try to reinvent everything that you both have said, but one thing I think it, that makes sense from a s salesperson standpoint is if, if we can get the customer to be that engaged with us, with all those segments, they're loyal. I mean, they're, the stickiness level goes way up, so if, if I'm looking for a financial benefit as a seller, not that I have to spend less time with you, but I don't have to spend quite as much, which frees me up to go prospect, to go look for new customers. I mean, I think it's a win-win. It's a um, yes, it's good for our company because we, we gain more market share with that customer, but when it's, when it's that locked up, I don't want to say we take, don't take it for granted. They still require a lot of service, but we all know that the new customer, it takes a whole lot more calls to gain those, right? So we can, we can grow business with our existing customers. It frees us up a little bit of time. Um, to sell more, and when I sell more, I get a bigger bonus, and so there's there's a reward there. Um, and the one thing that came to mind, uh, profit sharing, would be another reason why them. But the better our company does, the the better everyone does when we do profit sharing. Yeah, it's crazy to think that we could double our business without adding a customer. Going back to how hard it is to go get a new customer, if we can just cross sell and get that right with our current customer base, where could our business be? 
I mean, it's a really important factor. We know there are not uh, more farmers coming into the, the customer pool every day. There are less and less. And so learning how and making it a priority to grow the share of wallet with your existing customer base is going to continue to be really important into the future. Um, how have you guys leveraged your digital enablement platforms to drive and or track your cross-selling efforts across the organizations? I've heard notes, it sounds like, is at least a way, maybe? Yeah, no, notes for sure. I think the opportunity that we've really tried to take advantage of this past fall was, or in late summer, was when they made a fertilizer purchase that we combined that with a grain sale. That's what they should be doing, right? So making that very transparent for our, our grain team. I mean, that's where we, we really win because how many other companies can do that and have that conversation? So really setting our people up, setting our grain originators up with that information so they can smile and dial and try to buy some grain after we make a purchase or the, you know, the farmer makes a purchase. I, I would say we haven't. Well, like to be honest, we've, we are using the features, but we haven't. I think we haven't taken full advantage of the ability to... Um, like I, the business insights piece, I think like driving, generating some sort of static or non -static, however, which static or what, what's the other one? Lists, lists that are dynamic. 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 Um, making those lists and actually having sales reports run on them and using them. So right now, I think, I, I guess I would say we're in like step one, just start to know where the gaps were and get them changing their habits. Uh, and I, like I said, we're sort of getting our feet wet as we go. But what I, what I envision, I, maybe that's the way to say it, what I envision us doing is having that in front of them and reporting on it where they can see where they've made the growth. Because I do think the mentality is I already know, I know my guys from some of them, not all of them. And until you can put it in front of them to say like, see when you identified this pocket, there was growth there. And here's where you were last year. And here's where you are this year with that same group, or maybe it's changed now and all that. So I think using that business insights piece, like using some of those tools in there, we use notes, super effective, uh, but we could do better with it. There's, there's some stuff that would really increase our efficiency for sure. This is more operationally focused, but I think one of the tools that's there when you can look up what the customers got prepaid or what they purchased last year, kind of a twofold thing. From a salesperson's standpoint, what they purchased last year is pretty handy when you're trying to build the, the next year's plan. Um, but in the spring, when it's, it's, a, it's not a custom, a custom flight acre, it's a customer pickup acre, it's pretty nice that you can have it on your phone or the guys out back can have that on their phone and go, oh, this is what... XYZ Farms is coming in to pick up. It's I don't have to have it on a report. I can just look it up real quick, and there it is. Okay, that's everything on prepay. I'll get it ready. I'll get it on a pallet, get it ready to go. And from an operation standpoint, that's pretty pretty handy. Yeah, just the transparency of that is huge, right? Because we would run gap reports out of our ERP system, and by the time you got that report, it was like pretty dated. Now you can just go on the fly, and you can just come up with different ideas. What's what about this or what about that? And you can just do it just on the fly so quick. So, and I like it just from my perspective, right? If I see Joe Farmer out in the yard and I'm driving by his house, I can quickly look up his account, see what he's done with us. And nothing worse than being a the guy <laughs> that stops in and doesn't know that the guy just did bought something or sold something to us. It's always good to be in the know. I also really liked your smile and dial uh, phrase there. <laughs> um, so I've got one more question, then we're going to open it up for questions from you guys. So get to thinking if you've got something on your mind. Um, quick touch on segmentation. It's been mentioned a, a couple times here today, but what do you feel like has been the value in segmenting your customers, or what has it enabled you to do? So I've been River Valley for five years, and we've had segmentation then, but we've never really put it into practice up until like 2020, where we really started to think about it. So we've got three specific segmentations, but within that, there's, there's segments, there's many segments, right? And that's where I think the opportunity really lies. And I'll give you an example. So we have, uh, we're rolling out some sophisticated uh, risk management tools for, for our, our grain customers and trying to tie that with fertilizer. Well, not everybody wants to see that. Some guys are just cash sellers. They don't want to talk about it. They want to hear about it, what an option is. They just don't want to know. So we take that group and segmented that group is sophisticated, sophisticated grain sellers so we can communicate to them much differently than we would for your traditional grain, your grain customers. So there, that's one thing that really kind of comes to mind that we can drive. And there's so many different opportunities within the portal to do that. Yeah, I think that's a great point. There's really two ways to segment, right? There's what they're already buying and using the data you have. So where are the gaps between, you know, fertilizer buyers and chem buyers or whatever? And so 
we're using that, but probably the more more interesting one is the initiative we're doing we call Quest, and so they're identified as Quest growers, and by nature of doing Quest, they had to do a trial and a bunch of things. So now our Quest growers are becoming like their, you know, a version of what was our, we called like our A's or our key or whatever we want to call them, a more innovative group, if you were using the, psycho, the psychographic, psychographic segmentation, is that right? Um, they're more that group. So it allows us to contact and communicate with them differently, similar to what you're saying. It's like, it's not your cash guys. They appreciate, we can send them something that's more targeted and specific uh, value piece or invite them to um, some of our, you know, days where we talk about our research and data and those types of things uh, a little bit differently. Um, going back to the thing we did with suppliers, that was probably another, like a, a different version of segmentation yet. So guys who bought this but not that, especially for that specific Supplier, um, there's there's so many different approaches you could take, and I and I think at this point, to my point earlier of like finding our way through it, I don't know that any one is more effective than the other, but they have different purposes at different times, and we can do them all quickly. So uh, it's more making sure we're clear on which ones we're really focused on, um, and then going and then having initiatives around that. First off, I really, I really like that idea about the sophisticated grain buyer. I, I know my these guys, these ladies over here, were going. I think that's a, that's an opportunity we can build on. I, I like that. Um, but you think about from a crop protection standpoint, if whether it's BASF or Syngenta or Bayer or whoever, there's a lot of value in once you've gone down that path with one or two products, you might as well go the rest of the way. And so it's it's a nice tool to go if they've bought. A and B, but having bought C, that's an, that's an easy way to target. Uh, let's make sure we finish this because it's good for them because they're going to get more rewards and it's good for us because we're going to sell a little bit more and good for the grower hopefully because it's the right product and the right product mix. So I think that's a, certainly a valuable tool from a crop protection standpoint. Um, just aligning those, um, all those products that kind of fit into the program. Your, your comment about the sophisticated seller just makes me think that if you're really being strategic about targeting and segmenting your customers, you can make the message more specific. It's not going to be generalized and watered down to try and appease everyone in the customer base, but you found a group that you can really speak to exactly how they like to hear. Right, and that's what I like about the portal, too. You can mix it up, right? It's not that same email coming at you. It can be a push notification, it can be a text message, it can change the banner that the customer is looking at when they log into the portal. So there's a lot of different ways you can go at the, go at the customer. One of the ide ideas, we're not doing this, but an idea we had, uh, and if you maybe you've done it with your psychographic thing, we internally we use the disk profile. And so, as you know, the four, the four, four quadrants, and they, they like to be communicated to differently. And one of the ideas we had was let's put our D customers our I customers, our S, so that we can make them, if you're a D customer, don't give me a lot of detail. Give me the executive summary and let's roll, right? But if you're a, if you're a C and you want all the detail and I just gave you the summary, I just, you just annoyed me. And so it allows me, uh, allows us to communicate differently based on how the customer wants to be communicated to. And I, it's, we haven't done it, but I think that's something we'll certainly look into for the, for the upcoming year. All right. Do we have uh, any questions from the audience? The gentleman with the trustworthy haircut over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, so I'm going to go back to the, uh, the marketing side of things. I think you all did a great job of talking about how when you're pushing out some sort of a advertisement or, or marketing messaging, you align your sales staff to have conversations and communicate with that farmer in a you know, coinciding way. Uh, I've always had the view when I, when I was in retail that if you can leverage your supplier more effectively or monopolize their time or the resources better, you're in a competitive advantage or position from that perspective. And so I'm curious how you've either integrated the sales rep from the Bay or the BASF into that strategy or that tactic or how you think about potentially uh, moving forward with integrating them into the sales and, and marketing kind of tactics together? Yeah, for us, I think we, you know, we sat down with our key manufacturer partners and we showed them what the portal does and we show them how our go-to-market strategy is. We talk about our calendar. So I, I think that that was really impactful. So I think they know that we can deliver upon what we, what we promised to do. So that was, that's been big for us, just making it very transparent to them. Uh, so we basically did the same thing. Um, we started with them to show them like, hey, look what we can do. 
this is what we can run for you, all that stuff. I think the follow-up is the key part. So we've tried to kind of after each season, so sort of after in-crop, if there had been a fungicide season, we might have done it then, but there was not a lot of rain in Saskatchewan, so we skipped that one. Um, but so after a notable period of time, I guess, we'll meet with the rep and show them their data, their results, how we segmented, how they'd like us to change it. Sometimes they don't, you know, have even a lot of input, but they can see the results. And, and I really think, like, you can't change what you can't measure. So they can now see, they can measure that and, and you know, ask us to do it differently or see what's happening. Um, but it has engaged them differently, for sure. Um, it also, interestingly, engaged their you know, we'll say higher ups. So especially because we asked for a fairly significant amount of investment into it, it was outside of the, usually their local marketing budget. They then got their, you know, the territory manager, maybe in some cases the Western Canadian manager involved. And then they were like, okay, hey, what's going on? Like, what's, what are you guys doing? So now they're involved and they're seeing what's happening and they're thinking about it differently. So it has changed our engagement for sure at our local, you know, retail level with the reps, um, also corporately and with, um, with these companies. And I think they're seeing us differently, either different maybe here, but in Canada, you're either a line company or you're independent. There is no big co-ops in between. So you're either, you know, small in their eyes, even though we'd be large, small, we're still small, and you don't always get the same attention from, um, from those people, those parts of, or, you know, the higher, we'll say the higher ups, uh, the same way. And, and they don't necessarily, or hadn't necessarily always seen us as sophisticated either. So now it is. You know, it's a whole different world to deal with us with that level of technology, I guess, and ability to work with them than we ever had before. So long answer, but that's kind of how we've changed it. I was going to answer, but she took all the time. So we're <laughs> <laughs> no, I, the only other thing I was going to add to that that I think from a monopolizing time standpoint, if if we're transparent with our plans and we engage the the basic manufacturer reps in it, then they become part of the plan. And whether that's grower meetings. Uh, whether that's, okay, you're going to, we're going to call on these by ourselves, but we want you to ride with us for these four customers because they're, they're pivotal customers. I mean, that's part of the plan. And it, I mean, that's a win-win, right? Because we have their time, they're training our people, they're get, our people are getting better as, as a result of it, and the grower gets a better experience. So it's, that's how we engage the, the uh, basic manufacturers in that process. It was brought up in the conversations earlier, but the, you know, the manufacturer wants to win at the farm gate, right? So like the, that's where we come into play with best in class people. And the, the portal just complements that, right? So the more we can show that off to say, hey, we, we will help you be successful at the farm gate. That's important for us. You guys mentioned the, the yeah. you guys mentioned the psychographic segmentation, right? And uh, from past experience, it seems like we put a lot of burden on the sales staff to, to make sure they label those. Are you guys finding where any of the hard data, either geography, your past purchase history, or is enabling you to take some of that burden off and make some assumptions and create those segments? Or is the best method still to have each salesman label each guy? And if that's the case, how do you ensure it's good data? It's, how are you making sure the team's doing a good job of that? Um, I mean, that's a, that's a tough question. Okay, so I don't think, we're still taking the first approach, our, trusting what our team says, you know, Joe is this and John is that. So mostly we're still doing that. I think though, as we're using it more, um, we'll move more towards that, which is, which we're sort of now, you know, because they'll say to me, well, we don't need to call on, I know my guys, or, you know, I know who I sell this to, and I know who's not buying that, and we run it, and it's like, well, did you know about so-and-so, and were you, had you, you hadn't identified him on your list, so obviously not, and um, so it's changed that conversation a little bit. I'd like to get to that spot. I think it's, it's probably more difficult um, for all of the segmentations, but, you know, the, all, the other way to do it, which is inadvertently, I think, what we did with Quest was to have them self-select. So, hey, we're going to do this thing. If you're interested in doing a research trial on your farm and being part of this innovative thing, join us. And by nature, those people said, like, that's me. I want to be in that group. And now they're labeled. So we didn't really have to go through and pick out who they are. They signed on and but told I, us. Yeah, I understand you correctly. You had the, the growers actually identify. It wasn't the sellers doing it. It was your yeah. customers. Yeah, I mean, there would be a little bit of both. But, you know, really, we were like... 
it, you can't have joined without doing, without taking part in a research portion of it, which was not real intensive, but not for everybody. And the people who actually care, and what, it, weirdly, we found that a lot of people wanted to do the trial and didn't care about the trip, which tells us how much more people travel now also. But, or maybe that Florida's not that great. I don't know. One of the two. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, more, but we had more people who were like, we want to do this research on our farm. And so like, without going much further down that path, they sort of put their hands up and said, now I don't think that works to say, like, are you the guy who doesn't think you have to change anything because Grandpa did it the same way? Like, probably they're not putting their hands up. So, but maybe you can do that in a different way to sort of create some segments, um, which inadvertently is what's happened. And now we market our quest growers differently because of that. So, yeah. Other questions? All right, well, I've, I've got one in closing, but if you guys come up with another, uh, just put your hand up. What advice would you give to other agribusinesses who may be reluctant to either try digital marketing to their growers or start a cross-selling initiative in their organization? Yeah, I thought about that question a lot because I think you know we, we struggled for so long, I think, to get it right until we partnered with uh, AgVend in 2020. And uh, so just getting started, I mean, I think is the key thing, just getting some good key campaigns in place that you can drive, that really drive sales, um, that, that, that builds the belief of your sales team that it's the right thing to do and it's complementing their efforts. Um, I'd say start small, but get started is the main thing for me. Yeah, I was going to say the same. Pick something and just start. You can easily go down the rabbit hole, and you will. Like, that's probably our biggest nemesis right now is we're like, but we could do this and this and this, and what about this campaign? And then there's that product. There's so much. Like, now we know what we didn't know, and it's scary. So pick one thing. Pick one initiative. We, you know, backed it off outside of that project, backed it off, and we're like, hey, let's pick one product that we can kind of, like, mess up, so to speak. And, let's, and like, that was for our whole how we're approaching marketing. And let's not go down this rabbit hole. Just pick one thing, start. Send one email thing out and see how that happens. Get used to using the app. Get used to using and interacting. Get your staff used to using it. All of that stuff's pretty critical. Um, but yeah, I think just start. <laughs> Literally just pick something. It's not that scary. I'm not going to add a whole lot because you, got, you, you, you guys hit it on the head. But get started. Embrace change. Um, and, and don't be surprised if the, your whole organization isn't excited as you are. Um, so it's going to take a little time to, to build that momentum internally. Um, so be patient. Um, and have some accountability. You can't just hope it happens. You have to have a plan for internal implementation as well as much as you do grower engagement. Um, and that's, that's the th those are the things we're learning as we, as we go through this process as well. Yeah, I just think overall engagement of the team and really driving that. The one thing we did, I look back on, I think that really helped us is that every order had to go through the portal to be accepted, um, to be actually become a sale. So they couldn't go around the system, they had to put the order in the portal, and that drove internal adoption, which in, in, in the end uh, really helped with that external adoption. The common theme, I think, from last night and, and today really is just, you gotta take one step before you can take two. And it's so like you say, you're not trying to boil the ocean in one day. We, we have to make intentional choices to move forward, and, and it's about failing fast. Make a plan, try it out. What parts didn't work, iterate it, and try again. And, uh, but you got to start somewhere. All right, any last chance for any questions for our panel up here? I know we're standing between you and lunch, so I, I respect that. Um, all right, well, thank you all, and I will pass it back to Tracy. Thank you.